amended its constitution to enshrine the possession of nuclear weapons. The authorities in Pyongyang are repeatedly calling for an exponential increase in North Korea's nuclear arsenal. These provocations are helping to increase regional and international tensions. They constitute a direct challenge to the integrity of the international non-proliferation regime and also to the authority of the Security Council. This council cannot remain silent in the face of these violations. We regret that permanent members of the council, nuclear weapon states in the sense of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, are publicly expressing their support for the illicit programs of North Korea. This council must show unity and reaffirm the obligation to implement its own resolutions. This obligation applies to North Korea as it does to all of the member states of the United Nations. In this regard, we can only recall our concern with regard to the mutual arms transfers between North Korea and the Russian Federation. These constitute violations of the embargo established by resolutions of this council and direct support for the North Korean regime in its proliferation activities. France once again calls upon North Korea to comply with its international obligations. We call upon it to choose the path of diplomacy and to respond to the dialogue proposals that have been made to engage in discussions with a view to the complete, irreversible and verifiable abandonment of its weapons of mass destruction and ballistic missiles programs. Lastly, we call upon North Korea to prioritize the well-being of its population rather than devoting its scarce resources to the development of its nuclear arsenal by accelerating the reopening of its borders and the return of humanitarian actors. Thank you. I thank the representative of France. I give the floor to the representative of Japan. Thank you, Mr. President. I also thank A.C. Gary for his briefing. I must begin by my condemnation in the strongest terms on yet another launch by North Korea using ballistic missile technology in violation of multiple Security Council resolutions. It is particularly appalling that this reckless behavior was conducted despite the call from most council members and the Secretary General of North Korea not to conduct further launches at the council meetings in June and August on this matter. North Korea's series of unlawful actions, including the latest launch using ballistic missile technology, which flew directly over the Japanese archipelago, are threats to international peace and security and a serious challenge to the global non-proliferation regime. Japan joined the Secretary General in strongly condemning North Korea for this recent launch. Mr. President, let us recall the basics of our discussion today. We are not gathering here to discuss either the right to use outer space or the right of self-defense. The very name of this agenda item makes it clear. We are here to ensure the non-proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. The Security Council unanimously adopted multiple resolutions obligating North Korea not to conduct any further launches that use ballistic missile technology because it contributes to developing its delivery systems for nuclear weapons and poses a grave threat to the peace and security of the region and beyond. Let us be clear about our collective responsibility for the non-proliferation of WMDs. Let us not spiral into the ambiguities of political rhetoric. We should not be deceived by any attempt to justify North Korea's ambition to pursue unlawful WMD programs. <coughs> Sorry. The Security Council should be united on non-proliferation matters. I urge all Council members to reaffirm their commitment to the global non-proliferation regime that we all must value and uphold. Mr. President, North Korea has continued to ignore and deny its international obligations by pursuing its military ambition according to its five-year plan. Its actions are disrespectful of this Council and the United Nations Charter. It is high time for responsible Council members 
to restore the unity displayed in 2017 and live up to our commitment to firmly stand against proliferation. Otherwise, the Council only sends a wrong message, not just to Pyongyang, but to the entire world, including potential proliferators. In the light of not only widening <coughs> division within the international community of approaches to nuclear disarmament, but also the aggravating security environment, the international community must express grave concern over such an irresponsible act of North Korea and take decisive action to address it. Mr. President, Japan once again calls on all member states to fully implement relevant resolutions, and in this regard, arms transferred from North Korea to Russia, which directly violate relevant Security Council resolutions, are absolutely unacceptable. Such transfers would not only exacerbate the situation in Ukraine, but also severely undermine the non-proliferation regime. In addition, we are deeply concerned about the potential for any transfer of nuclear or ballistic missile-related technology to North Korea, which would further threaten the peace and stability of the region as well as across the globe. We call on North Korea and Russia to abide by their obligations under all relevant Security Council resolutions and immediately cease all activities that violate them. In concluding, Japan demands that North Korea immediately and fully comply with all relevant resolutions, engage in diplomacy, and resume substantive dialogue. The path to dialogue remains open. The world is watching to see whether we, in this chamber, can fulfill our responsibility. I thank you. I thank the representative of Japan. I give the floor to the representative of Malta. Thank you, President. I also thank ESG Chiari for his informative briefing. The ongoing, relentless and advancement of the DPRK's nuclear and ballistic missile programs is illegal and deeply concerning. In 2023 alone, the DPRK has carried out four ICBM launches. We meet today following the most recent launch of a military reconnaissance satellite by the DPRK in violation of multiple Security Council resolutions, and despite many international calls to refrain from engaging in such actions. This is a threat to international peace and security, and we condemn it in the strongest possible terms. Malta remains firm in its belief that these acts increase tensions and further destabilize the region. They pose a serious threat to international peace and security and erode the global non-proliferation regime. The launch was successful in placing the satellite in orbit. This, in itself, is a very worrisome development. Even more troubling, the DPRK Space Agency stated that the launch, and I quote, will make a significant contribution to definitely ramping up the war preparedness of the armed forces of the Republic, end quote. It further stated that it would send multiple reconnaissance satellites in the near future. The Council cannot remain silent or turn a blind eye faced with this situation. Malta is gravely concerned that the DPRK has successfully obtained technical guidance from another country to complete this launch. This is not only acceptable in itself, but is also a clear violation of the obligations under the 1718 sanctions regime. President, the DPRK must seize all confrontations, engage meaningful dialogue with all parties, and adhere to its obligations under Security Council resolutions. It must completely, verifiably, and irreversibly abandon its nuclear and ballistic missiles program, and return to the Non-Proliferation Treaty and IAEA safeguards. Persistent Council divisions and failures to speak with one voice to condemn these actions have only emboldened the DPRK. This most recent launch clearly confirms it. The Council, as the guarantor of international peace and security, should act accordingly. Malta also remains deeply concerned about the dire humanitarian situation and the grave human rights violations perpetrated by the regime. They are inextricably linked to the advancement of its WMD program and cannot be neglected. 
A reopening of borders to international humanitarian staff is essential to allow UN agencies to carry out a rapid needs assessment in the country. In closing, President, we reiterate that the only way to achieve peace and denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula is by ensuring that DPRK refrains from further provocations and dangerous actions. For this, we need a united Security Council, and we cannot afford to wait any longer. I thank you. I thank the representative of Malta. I will give the floor to the representative of Mozambique. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I wish to thank uh, Assistant Secretary General Khaled Kiari uh, for the information and important update on this topic. I also acknowledge the presence of the permanent representatives of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea and the Republic of Korea in this chamber. Mr. President, Mozambique expresses its deep concern over the launch of the Maligyong One reconnaissance satellite from the DPRK Sohai Satellite Launch Facility on November 21st, 2023. The missile, launch, the missile launch has been reported to have used ballistic missile technology. It is important to remind ourselves again that the situation in the Korean Peninsula is highly sensitive and all activities, including the launch of a military reconnaissance satellite, military exercise in the region, among others that may contribute to worsening and could ignite the situation, are to be avoided. This Security Council repeatedly has emphasized the need for dialogue <coughs> towards a sustainable peace and the complete and verifiable denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. We therefore urge the DPRK to respect and adhere to all Security Council resolutions and to commit to de uh, denuclearization and help resolve this persistent crisis in the Korean Peninsula. We also reiterate our call for all interested parties to be involved in the issue of non-regulation on the Korean Peninsula to act with utmost caution and with responsibility. It is imperative to avoid any unilateral actions that could exacerbate the already tenuous detente in the region. Mr. President, the issue of non-proliferation of nuclear weapons is critical, not only for the Korean Peninsula, but throughout the world. The Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons aims to prevent the spread of nuclear weapons and weapons technology while promoting the peaceful uses of nuclear energy and achieve nuclear disarmament and general and complete disarmament. In this context, nuclear technology can play a better role in the development of humanity for the health and well-being of the populations. It is also used to produce electricity, which is well managed, if it's well managed, is a clean and reliable source of energy. However, it is important to ensure that the nuclear technology is used for peaceful purposes and not for other harmful purposes, which in turn lead to regional, if not global, insecurity and instability. Mozambique reiterates, reiterates its call for the need to intensify diplomatic engagement and seize all available opportunities to persuade the DPRK to resume constructive dialogue, accepting the goodwill of the international community. Mr. President, while acknowledging the need to safeguard the genuine security concerns of the parties, Mozambique appealed to all members of the Security Council not to block or waver any decisive action aimed at seeking a permanent solution to this serious threat to peace and prosperity of the Korean Peninsula and the region at large. In fact, growing tension on the Korean Peninsula and the DPRK determination to continue develop, developing its uh, te technical capabilities make it imperative to opt for the path to dialogue to achieve the desired peace in the region. Mozambique reiterates its stance that peaceful dialogue and negotiations are the best way to resolve any difference in the Korean Peninsula. 
In this regard, we call for practical measures to curb tensions and create a space for diplomacy, emphasizing the importance of re-establishing communication channels and reversing the current dangerous dynamics. Diplomacy and dialogue, not isolation, is the only way forward. I thank you, Mr. President. I thank the representative of Mozambique. I give the floor to the representative of the UK. Thank you, President. And I thank Assistant Secretary General Chiari for his briefing. And I welcome the participation of the Republic of Korea and the Democratic People's Republic of Korea at this meeting. As we've heard, we meet because on the 21st of November, the DPRK made a third attempt at launching a military reconnaissance satellite. It triggered Japan's local alert system in Okinawa, forcing civilians to take shelter. That was followed by a ballistic missile launch on the 22nd of November. These are clear threats to global peace and security, which is the core responsibility of this council. And they violate multiple Security Council resolutions. Moreover, these launches follow increased engagement between Russia and the DPRK, including Kim Jong-un's visit to Vastochny Cosmodrome in September, where he met President Putin. When asked by a reporter whether Russia would help North Korea launch its own satellites and rockets, President Putin responded, that's exactly why we came here. The leader of North Korea shows great interest in space. We have, in addition, credible reports of Russia sourcing weapons from the DPRK. All this, as ASG Chiari said, said has humanitarian consequences. The North Korean people suffer the most as resources are diverted. So what should this council do? Some argue that this council should remain silent and avoid escalating the situation. But the DPRK shows no sign of restraint in response. In fact, the DPRK has stated its intention to launch more satellites. This follows 29 launches of ballistic missiles so far this year including four intercontinental ballistic missiles. The DPRK has written its nuclear aspirations into its constitution. So what should we do? First, I welcome the participation of DPRK in today's debate. Above all, I hope you will report to Pyongyang our concern for the people of DPRK. And in this respect, I encourage the DPRK to reopen its borders and re-engage with UN agencies. Second, this council should reiterate the depth of our resolve to combating non-proliferation, to combating proliferation. We urge the DPRK to cease its arms supply and abide by its public commitment not to sell arms to Russia. Third, we urge the DPRK to cease these launches, return to dialogue, and take credible steps towards denuclearization and peace on the Korean Peninsula. President, I urge this Council to demonstrate our commitment to ensure that our resolutions are enforced and to send a united message to the DPRK. And I thank you. I thank the representative of the United Kingdom and now give the floor to Switzerland. Mr. President, we remercions the Sous Secretary General Chiari for his exposure and welcome the participation of the representatives of the Republic of Korea and the Republic of Korea in our deliberations. Switzerland has noted with the utmost concern the launch by the DPRK after two 
early attempts this year of a military reconnaissance satellite using ballistic missile technology. We note that this latest launch was carried out ahead of time, <coughs> ahead of the time that is indicated in the notice to mariners and airmen, thus voiding the warning of its purpose. Switzerland condemns every launch using ballistic missile technology because these are violations of this Council's resolutions. The Council must not remain passive in the face of these tests, which, together with the DPRK's nuclear program, constitute a threat to international peace and security. Allow me to emphasize three points. Firstly, any launch using ballistic missile technology is a violation of international law, and namely of Security Council resolutions. As we discussed at our meetings in June and August, the issues of rocket payload or prior notification are not decisive in this situation. This Council, therefore, should condemn and respond to these launches. We reiterate our call upon the DPRK to renounce any future attempts to launch ballistic missiles. Secondly, while the obligations arising from resolutions apply first and foremost to the DPRK, they also apply to all states who are required to effectively implement Security Council sanctions. In addition, as parties to the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons, we are obliged to combat the proliferation of nuclear weapons. Cooperation projects in the field of space and armaments are in principle incompatible with Security Council sanctions unless previously exempted by the 1718 Committee. Attempts to legitimize the pursuit of a nuclear program by the DPRK itself or by other states require our continued vigilance. We must commit to disarmament and to maintaining the nuclear taboo. Thirdly, let us not forget the plight of the DPRK's people. The serious and systematic violations of human rights and the impunity of the perpetrators must stop. We welcome signs that the heavy restrictions put in place by the DPRK in connection with the pandemic are being eased. These restrictions are a major obstacle to human humanitarian aid and to the respect and exercise of human rights. The opening of the DPRK's borders must go hand in glove with rapid, safe and unimpeded access for humanitarian aid to achieve that goal, the entry of international personnel into the DPRK is vital. Mr. President, this Council plays a vital role in encouraging dialogue, de-escalation and the exploration of diplomatic solutions. We must strengthen and not weaken the scant confidence-building measures which exist, in particular those aimed at reducing the risk of a military confrontation such as the 2018 agreement between the two careers. As recommended by the new agenda for peace, we must reverse the erosion of international norms aimed at preventing the spread and use of nuclear weapons. We must also strengthen prevention and mediation. Moreover, we encourage the UN to step up its efforts in this domain. This will facilitate the implementation of a peaceful, comprehensive and lasting solution to the situation on the Korean Peninsula. We have a common goal and a shared responsibility in this regard. Switzerland will we remain committed to peace and stability in the DPRK. I thank you. I thank Switzerland. I now give floor to Gabon. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank Assistant Secretary General Khaled Khairi for his briefing. And we welcome to this meeting the permanent representative of the DPRK and of the Republic of Korea. Gabon is concerned by the launch of a military reconnaissance satellite and its placement in Earth, Earth orbit by the DPRK on the 21st of November. This missile launch adds to a long long list of such launches amassed since the beginning of the year, it heightens the security risk in the Korean Peninsula. Regular alarms raised by these missile launches constitute not only an unbearable source of stress for the people in the region, they also constitute a veritable danger for air and maritime navigation. My country condemns this new missile launch and calls upon parties concerned to open channels 
for discussion in order to find a lasting solution to this situation which has now become untenable. We remain convinced that it is through dialogue that a lasting and mutually acceptable solution will be reached. The threat of use of nuclear weapons is increasingly significant. The dismantling of disarmament agreements and the U-turns that we're seeing with certain countries regarding their disarmament and nuclear non-proliferation commitments are contributing to the current situation, a situation marked by the trivialization of the recourse to nuclear weapons and by the use of weapons of mass destruction and the trivialization of their Use. The levels of tension and the lack of progress on talks since 2018 on the situation on the Korean Peninsula is particularly worrying. It is vital that parties be able to restore the calm necessary and to rebuild trust in order to find a diplomatic solution. Negotiation remains the best option to find common ground among the various parties and to achieve the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. It is vital that the international community reaffirm its determination to strive towards the complete and verifiable denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula with a view to the peaceful coexistence of the countries in the region. I wish to conclude by reaffirming my country's will to see a world free of weapons of mass destruction and free of nuclear weapons. I thank you. I thank Gabon. I now give floor to Basil. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank ASG Khaled Kiari for his briefing, and I welcome the participation of the representative of the Republic of Korea and of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea at this meeting. I thank the U.S. and other fellow Security Council members for requesting this meeting. Once again, Brazil joins the international community in condemning the use of ballistic missile technology in the launch of a satellite launch vehicle by the DPRK on November 21st. While fully recognizing the right of all countries to pursue peaceful space programs, the DPRK must strictly comply with all of its obligations under international law and Security Council resolutions. The launch of the SLV before the opening of the launch window announced by the DPRK posed risks to aircraft, ships, and civilian populations in the region. Above all, the withdrawal from the 2018 Comprehensive Military Agreement between South Korea and the DPRK is a step backwards, away from dialogue and a peaceful understanding. This development could lead to accidents and misunderstandings along the inter-Korean border, which would put the security of the entire world at risk. We urge all parties to return to the negotiating table and avoid any measures that could further escalate the already tense situation. Beyond the use of ballistic missile technology, we are also concerned about what this latest launch represents for a broader process of militarization of space and for regional stability. The placement into orbit of the Malig Yong-1 reconnaissance satellite and the DPRK's statement that it would launch several reconnaissance satellites in a short span of time suggests that the dynamics of competition in the region is entering a new phase, a phase with greater use of space assets to enhance warfighting capabilities. The General Assembly has been actively engaged in discussions on space security precisely to create a framework of binding and non-binding norms that allowed us to manage the growing competition in outer space. This latest launch further illustrates the need for such a framework. That is why we urge Council members to redouble their efforts towards finding a common path forward in these discussions. Over the past two years, we have seen the DPRK make significant military advances. We have seen them add two new classes of ICBMs to their arsenal, one of them solid fueled, and test a new intermediate range missile that overflew Japan last year. This successful launch of a spy satellite is the latest step in a long series of unconstrained advances. This adds tension to a situation that should be tackled by negotiation based on a good political will and good diplomacy. That is why we are now more convinced than ever that we need a new approach to this file. 
We have reiterated that the Council must do more, but that doing more does not mean doing more of the same, as we keep doing here every time there is a new launch. We see the need for three Cs in this file, creativity, compromise, and collaboration. Creativity to explore new approaches to this file, such as making better use of the Council's Chapter 6 toolkit. Compromise because views are so far apart that we must begin to work on whatever we can agree, no matter how basic that may be. Finally, we need more collaboration at the expert level. In the last two years, we were never as close to consensus as when all of our experts were meeting regularly to share ideas and work on text. More regular collaboration at the expert level can prevent these meetings from becoming reiterations of 15 distinct national well-known views. We have been encouraged by discussions we have had with council members who have shared our interest in finding new ways to make progress. We have talked with most of you about a greater role for the UN in promoting contacts with the DPRK and convincing this country to trust diplomacy in the good offices of its fellow UN members. We intend to continue to take these ideas forward and we hope to have at least rekindled the discussion on new ideas for achieving a Korean Peninsula that is peaceful, stable and free of nuclear weapons. Thank you. I thank Basile for the file. I now give the floor to Russia. Mr. President, we listened closely to the briefing by Assistant Secretary General Khaled Kiari, and we also welcome the participation in the meeting of the permanent representatives of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea and the Republic of Korea. Russia is concerned by the rapid development of a new cycle of escalation on the Korean Peninsula. In recent months, we have been hearing from Washington and its allies in the region regular alarmist signals about the DPRK building up its ballistics program, which is a threat to their national security. At every opportunity, the U.S. delegation convenes the Security Council to present itself almost as the victim of a situation that was allegedly created by Pyongyang alone. However, let's slightly broaden the scope of today's subject and take a look at the current state of affairs in the region as a whole. In March, we already drew, drew the Council attention to the bellicose maneuvers by the USA, Japan, and the Republic of Korea that were conducted in direct proximity, direct proximity to the borders of the DPRK. Even back then, the Allies' Freedom Shield and Sang Yong military exercises under the leadership of Washington were of a stunning scale. It seemed to many that the region had reached a dangerous threshold beyond which the possibilities for a political settlement would be reduced to naught. Unfortunately, since then, the proper conclusions were not drawn, and the show of U.S. military force thousands of kilometers from its borders continues to break records. Thus far this year, the Allies have already conducted six joint exercises with the direct involvement of the American Armed Forces. Let's just look at the most recent examples. On the 15th of November, for the second time in the space of a month, two U.S. Uh, B-52 strategic bombers arrived on the territory of the peninsula on the 16th of November in the Sea of Japan. The latest major exercises of the U.S. and Republic of Korea navies came to an end. They involved heavy offensive weapons, including destroyers, fighters, and helicopters. On the 21st of November, the port of Busan was visited by a U.S. carrier strike group led by the USS Carl Wilson, Vinson. Excuse me. This was a month after it was visited by another American aircraft carrier, the Ronald Reagan. It's very interesting to hear from the U.S. delegation how these actions are in line with the requirements of Paragraph 28 of Security Council Resolution 2397 regarding the need to work to reduce tensions in the Korean Peninsula and beyond. 
Mr. President, today the Security Council was convened in relation to the rocket launch from DPRK territory of a reconnaissance satellite which triggered a very sharp reaction in the West. Russia does not support the steps of any of the sides which run counter to the aims of establishing long-term peace in the region. At the same time, when assessing this news, we propose taking note of the fact that back on the 7th of November, we learned about Seoul's plans to, at the end of the month, month launch their first reconnaissance satellite from America's Vandenberg base. Moreover, it's also noteworthy that the government of the Republic of Korea, by way of a retaliatory measure, took the decision to partially suspend the effect of the inter-Korean military agreement of 2018, which plays an important role in maintaining stability and preventing armed incidents in the area of the military demarcation line. Such steps, of course, would have caused a reaction. Also of concern are contradictory signals from the U.S.'s allies in Northeast Asia, Tokyo and Seoul, about so-called strengthening cooperation with Washington in the nuclear sphere, which could absolutely be interpreted as allowing for the possibility of deploying on their territory American nuclear weapons and the development of their own. Today, incidentally, we once again did not hear a due assessment of these provocative steps from the Secretariat. Russia has consistently advocated for a peaceful settlement of the whole range of problems of the Korean Peninsula exclusively through political diplomatic means, without outside pressure or blackmail. The Russian-Chinese draft political humanitarian resolution of the Security Council remains on the table. Its adoption could constitute an effective, constructive contribution of the Council to resolving the current complex situation on the Korean Peninsula. Mr. President. Today, from several delegations, we heard accusations against Russia of so-called illegal military technical cooperation between Russia and the DPRK. These suppositions are unfounded. Russia responsibly complies with its international obligations. This does not prevent us from developing a traditional relationships of friendship and cooperation with our neighbors, including the DPRK, relations that have long-standing historical roots. Attempts to besmirch Russia in the context of the situation on the Korean Peninsula conceal a desire to distract the Council from the real root causes of instability in the region linked to the U.S.'s ambitions to suffocate Pyongyang at any cost. Taking a look at the situation in the broader context, it is clear that Washington essentially has no levers of influence left on Pyongyang. That's increasingly mentioned in the expert community. However, instead of forcefully trying to establish that influence, isn't it time for Washington to think about extending to Pyongyang a hand of mutually respectful dialogue? Any undertaking will require gradual steps. However, for the time being, we see that these steps are going in completely the complete opposite direction. Mr. President, we firmly call upon the parties to cease dangerous actions which could lead to a large-scale conflict. By all appearances, we are witnessing an endless vicious circle within which the military political triangle led by the USA, instead of trying to facilitate a settlement of relations between neighbors, is in fact provoking a further escalation of tensions. Against this backdrop, it is no surprise that Pyongyang, which an extremely powerful nuclear power is trying to back into a corner, is trying to take the steps that it can in the interests of self-defense. We are convinced that endlessly discussing the DPRK's violations and the subsequent punitive measures is a senseless way to go about things. Significant efforts to emerge from this deadlock will not occur until the parties show a genuine interest in ensuring security in the region. Thank you for your attention. I thank the representative of the Russian Federation for their statement, and I'll give the floor to the representative of Ghana. Of Ghana. I thank ASG Kiari for his briefing to the Council and welcome the participation of the permanent representatives of the Republic of Korea and the Democratic People's Republic of Korea at this meeting. Mr. President, while the Council's attention has been focused elsewhere, the DPRK has continued the development of its capabilities in breach of multiple Security Council resolutions. Ghana is gravely concerned by the DPRK's launch of a military reconnaissance satellite on 21st September and the third of such launch in the last six months. These acts by the DPRK 
are against its international obligations as expressed in multiple Security Council resolutions. We deplore the latest launch and call on the DPRK to fully comply with its international obligations as expressed under relevant Security Council resolutions by refraining from further launches with ballistic missile technology. Mr. President, anti-proliferation mechanisms that once served as guardrails by keeping nuclear ambitions in check are failing. The North Korean nuclear impasse is part of this trend. We continue to see the erosion of trust and the spike of political polarization on this file, which has paralyzed this council and rendered it unable to act. After years of very little or no progress on this file, we must resist the temptation of doing nothing because the cost of inaction is far greater than the cost of action. In this regard, we continue to urge the international community to implement pragmatic measures while simultaneously pursuing long-term engagement within a multilateral framework arrangement to restrict DPRK's weapons development program. More specifically, we would like to share some priority areas of action. First, at the heart of pragmatic solutions is the urgent need to rebuild trust, solidarity, and mutual respect through dialogue and diplomacy, which considers the concerns of all members. After three years, the DPRK is showing signs of reopening. Recent bilateral engagement with its neighbors and with this council are critical first steps in trust and confidence building. Diplomatic channels of communication between the DPRK, its neighbors, and other stakeholders through regular in-person meetings should be prioritized as pandemic restrictions are gradually lifted. We continue to urge the DPRK to expedite action on the return of UN country teams as well as other aid agencies. Second, sanctions are important in the toolbox of the Security Council for the maintenance of international peace and security. Sanctions are, however, not an end in themselves. While we commend the 1718 Committee for its proactive approach in addressing the humanitarian situation in the DPRK within the framework of exemptions in the existing sanctions, we must also address the unintended consequences of sanctions on the DPRK in a swift and all-rounded manner. It is also important to evaluate thoroughly the DPRK sanction regime to better understand the gaps that have enabled sanctions override and the facilitation of its nuclear weapons program without hindrance. Third, a comprehensive multilateral and security solution to the issue on the Korean Peninsula is necessary. As it is often said, regional solutions to regional problems. Over the years, however, conflicting national interests among regional actors have hindered the successful and coordinated multilateral security efforts to resolve the issues on the Korean Peninsula. It is time for regional actors and other key stakeholders to lead the effort at addressing the security and developmental challenges of their region. In conclusion, Mr. President, we recognize that the threat posed by the DPRK to international security is serious and growing. As a council, we must find better ways of sustaining the Council's unity on this matter and pursuing long-term engagement within a multilateral framework arrangement to restrict DPRK's weapons development program. Where difficult options must be embraced, we should be bold to accept this because time may not be on the side of the Council if we wait too long. Our responsibility is to steer the region away from the path of catastrophe and preserve the peace and lives on the peninsula. I thank you for your attention. Okay, I thank Ghana, the representative of Ghana for their statement and I'll give the floor to the representative of the UAE. Mr. President, I thank Assistant Secretary General Khiari for his briefing and I welcome the participation of the representatives of the Republic of Korea and the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. The United Arab Emirates strongly condemns yet another launch of a military reconnaissance satellite by the DPRK using ballistic missile technology. 
Not only does this launch blatantly defy Security Council resolutions, it follows a record high number of similar violations over the past two years. The DPRK's actions are a source of major concern as they increase tensions in the Korean Peninsula and undermine the global non-proliferation regime. We strongly urge the DPRK to desist from its activities which are a flagrant violation of international law. The DPRK satellite launch violates this Council's prohibition regarding the use of ballistic missile technology by the DPRK. In fact, the satellite launch may have been pursued to conduct yet another illicit test of long-range ballistic missile technology. It is imperative that these provocations, provocative actions come to an end. For our meeting today, I'd like to make three points. First, the DPRK must immediately cease all launches and testing involving ballistic missile technology as stipulated repeatedly by Security Council resolutions. Even though the authorities in Pyongyang issued early warnings to Japan, such warnings do not confer legitimacy to launches. We therefore call on the DPRK to adhere to international law and Security Council resolutions and refrain from conducting future illegal launches. Second, the Council must send a strong unified message to the DPRK, condemning its provocative behavior and encouraging dialogue. We reiterate that diplomacy and de-escalation is the only path to achieve peace and security on the Korean Peninsula. Restraint is critical to avoid unintended escalation. Engagement, not isolation, is the only way forward. The calls for dialogue have been repeated many times, and it is time for the DPRK to heed them. Third, the humanitarian situation in the DPRK continues to be a source of serious concern especially given that, UN re that recent UN reports indicate that a staggering 45% of the population, roughly 12 million people, are in need of humanitarian assistance. As the country gradually reopens its borders, we emphasize the urgency of resuming on-the-ground humanitarian activities by international humanitarian agencies. We hope that the DPRK will prioritize their return to the country, including that of the UN resident coordinator. Mr. President, the ultimate objective is clear, to achieve a complete, verifiable, and irreversible denuclearization of the DPRK and the DPRK's return to the Non-Proliferation Treaty. Therefore, we call upon Council members, alongside the Secretary General, to reinvigorate diplomatic efforts to resume peace talks and to deter and curb the DPRK's nuclear weapons and ballistic missiles program. Unified action today will lead to a safer tomorrow on the Korean Peninsula. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank the UA and now I make a statement in my capacity as president of China. I thank ESTRE for his briefing and welcome the PRs of the PRK and ROK to this meeting. China is taking note of the satellite launch announced by the PRK on the 22nd of December and of the reactions of parties concerned. China is taking note of the series of launches by the PRK as well as the ongoing military activities of countries concerned on the peninsula. China is deeply concerned about the escalation of antagonism and confrontation and the continuing tension on the peninsula, which is increasingly downward spiraling. If the situation on the peninsula is allowed to deteriorate in this way, it may eventually spiral out of control. It will only jeopardize the continuous interests of the countries of the North East Asia, undermine the efforts of treatments made by all parties over the past several decades in the political settlement of the West of the Peninsula. It will only add new turbulence and instability to an already troubled world, which is a source of great concern to China. This year, the Council has held several public meetings to consider the PRK nuclear issue, as well as a number of internal consultations. China has already set up fully its position today to underline only a few points. 
各国安全不可分割，任何国家都不可能以牺牲别国的安全为代价，追求自身的安全。如果朝方总是感到威胁，其合理安全关切始终得不到解决，半岛就无法真正的走出安全困境，只会陷入相互恃强的恶性循环。第二，半岛问题作为冷战残余，延宕几十年未决，核心在于和平机制的缺失。各方应当按照双轨并进思路，并行推进半岛无核化和建立半岛和平机制。中国对话，均衡解决各自的合理关系，包括朝方的合理安全关系。这是解决半岛问题的。And that is the fundamental way out for the question of the peninsula. Third, Panama problem's solution is not a favorable environment. It is indispensable for the resolution of the issue. The United States, on the other hand, is expressing concern about the tension on the peninsula. The United States has taken the opportunity to strengthen the military alliances, provoke block confrontation, and mobilize the allies to mitigate the threat. Finally, the United States has taken the opportunity to strengthen the military alliances, provoke block confrontation, and mobilize the allies to mitigate the threat. Finally, the United States has taken the opportunity to strengthen the military alliances, provoke block confrontation, and mobilize the allies to mitigate the threat. Finally, the United States has taken the opportunity to strengthen the military alliances, provoke block confrontation, and mobilize the allies to mitigate the threat. Finally, the United States has taken the opportunity to strengthen the military alliances, provoke block confrontation, and mobilize the allies to mitigate the threat. Finally, the United States has taken the opportunity to strengthen the military alliances, provoke block confrontation, and mobilize the allies to mitigate the threat. Finally, the United States has taken the opportunity to strengthen the military alliances, provoke block confrontation, and mobilize the allies to mitigate the threat. Finally, the United States has taken the opportunity to strengthen the military alliances, provoke block confrontation, and mobilize the allies to mitigate the threat. Finally, the United States has taken the opportunity to strengthen the military alliances, provoke block confrontation, and mobilize the allies to mitigate the threat. Finally, the United States has taken the opportunity to strengthen the military alliances, provoke block confrontation, and mobilize the allies to mitigate the threat. Finally, the United States has taken the opportunity to strengthen the military alliances, provoke block confrontation, and mobilize the allies to mitigate the threat. Finally, the United States has taken the opportunity to strengthen the military alliances, provoke block confrontation, and mobilize the allies to mitigate the threat. Finally, the United States has taken the opportunity to strengthen the military alliances, provoke block confrontation, and mobilize the allies to mitigate the threat. Finally, And should come up with a practical and feasible proposal to reveal the trust between the sides, and encourage the DPRK to join the dialogue and negotiations. Finally, the United States has taken the opportunity to strengthen the military alliances, provoke block confrontation, and mobilize the allies to mitigate the threat. Finally, the United States has taken the opportunity to strengthen the military alliances, provoke block confrontation, and mobilize the allies to mitigate the threat. Finally, the United States has taken the opportunity to strengthen the military alliances, provoke block confrontation, and mobilize the allies to mitigate the threat. Finally, the United States has taken the opportunity to strengthen the military alliances, provoke block confrontation, and mobilize the allies to mitigate the threat. Finally, the United States has taken the opportunity to strengthen the military alliances, provoke block confrontation, and mobilize the allies to mitigate the threat. Finally, the United States has taken the opportunity to strengthen the military alliances, provoke block confrontation, and mobilize the allies to mitigate the threat. Finally, the United States has taken the opportunity to strengthen the military alliances, provoke block confrontation, and mobilize the allies to mitigate the threat. Finally, the United States has taken the opportunity to strengthen the military alliances, provoke block confrontation, and mobilize the allies to mitigate the threat. Finally, the United States has taken the opportunity to strengthen the military alliances, provoke block confrontation, and mobilize the allies to mitigate the threat. Finally, the United States has taken the opportunity to strengthen the military alliances, provoke block confrontation, and mobilize the allies to mitigate the threat. Finally, the United States has taken the opportunity to strengthen the military alliances, provoke block confrontation, and mobilize the allies to mitigate the threat. Finally, the United States has taken the opportunity to strengthen the military alliances, provoke block confrontation, and mobilize the allies to mitigate the threat. Finally, the United States has taken the opportunity to strengthen the military alliances, provoke block confrontation, and mobilize the allies to mitigate the threat. Finally, the United States has taken the opportunity to strengthen the military alliances, provoke block confrontation, and mobilize the allies to mitigate the threat. Finally, the United States has taken the opportunity to strengthen the military alliances, provoke block confrontation, and mobilize the allies to mitigate the threat. Finally, the United States has taken the opportunity to strengthen the military alliances, provoke block confrontation, and mobilize the allies to mitigate the threat. Finally, the United States has taken the opportunity to strengthen the military alliances, provoke block confrontation, and mobilize the allies to mitigate the threat. Finally, the United States has taken the opportunity to strengthen the military alliances, provoke block confrontation, and mobilize the allies to mitigate the threat. Finally, the United States has taken the opportunity to strengthen the military alliances, provoke block confrontation, and mobilize the allies to mitigate the threat. Finally, the United States has taken the opportunity to strengthen the military alliances, provoke block confrontation, and mobilize the allies to mitigate the threat. Finally, the United States has taken the opportunity to strengthen the military alliances, provoke block confrontation, and mobilize the allies to mitigate the threat. Finally, the United States has taken the opportunity to strengthen the military alliances, provoke block confrontation, and mobilize the allies to mitigate the threat. Finally, the United States has taken the opportunity to strengthen the military alliances, provoke block confrontation, and mobilize the allies to mitigate the threat. Finally, the United States has taken the opportunity to strengthen the military alliances, provoke block confrontation, and mobilize the allies to mitigate the threat. Finally, the United States has taken the opportunity to strengthen the military alliances, provoke block confrontation, and mobilize the allies to mitigate the threat. Finally, the United States has taken the opportunity to strengthen the military alliances, provoke block confrontation, and mobilize the allies to mitigate the threat. Finally, the United States has taken the opportunity to strengthen the military alliances, provoke block confrontation, and mobilize the allies to mitigate the threat. Finally, the United States has taken the opportunity to strengthen the military alliances, provoke block confrontation, and mobilize the allies to mitigate the threat. Finally, the United States has taken the opportunity to strengthen the military alliances, provoke block confrontation, and mobilize the allies to mitigate the threat. Finally, the United States has taken the opportunity to strengthen the military alliances, provoke block confrontation, and mobilize the allies to mitigate the threat. Finally, the United States has taken the opportunity to strengthen the military alliances, provoke block confrontation, and mobilize the allies to mitigate the threat. Finally, the United States has taken the opportunity to strengthen the military alliances, provoke block confrontation, and mobilize the allies to mitigate the threat. Finally, the United States has taken the opportunity to strengthen the military alliances, provoke block confrontation, and mobilize the allies to mitigate the threat. Finally, the United States has taken the opportunity to strengthen the military alliances, provoke block confrontation, and mobilize the allies to mitigate the threat. Finally, the United States has taken the opportunity to strengthen the military alliances, provoke block confrontation, and mobilize the allies to mitigate the threat. Finally, the United States has taken the opportunity to strengthen the military alliances, provoke block confrontation, and mobilize the allies to mitigate the threat. Finally, the United States has taken the opportunity to strengthen the military alliances, provoke block confrontation, and mobilize the allies to mitigate the threat. Finally, the United States has taken the opportunity to strengthen the military alliances, provoke block confrontation, and mobilize the allies to mitigate the threat. Finally, the United States has taken the opportunity to strengthen the military alliances, provoke block confrontation, and mobilize the allies to mitigate the threat. Finally, the United States has taken the opportunity to strengthen the military alliances, provoke block confrontation, and mobilize the allies to mitigate the threat. Finally, the United States has taken the opportunity to strengthen the military alliances, provoke block confrontation, and mobilize the allies to mitigate the threat. Finally, the United States has taken the opportunity to strengthen the military alliances, provoke block confrontation, and mobilize the allies to mitigate the threat. Finally, the United States has taken the opportunity to strengthen the military alliances, provoke block confrontation, and mobilize the allies to mitigate the threat. Finally, the United States has taken the opportunity to strengthen the military alliances, provoke block confrontation, and mobilize the allies to mitigate the threat. Finally, the United States has taken the opportunity to strengthen the military alliances, provoke block confrontation, and mobilize the allies to mitigate the threat. Finally, the United States has taken the opportunity to strengthen the military alliances, provoke block confrontation, and mobilize the allies to mitigate the threat. Finally, the United States has taken the opportunity to strengthen the military alliances, provoke block confrontation, and mobilize the allies to mitigate the threat. Finally, the United States has taken the opportunity to strengthen the military alliances, provoke block confrontation
is vulnerable, so that we could be fully prepared for them with their aggressive nature becoming all the clear as the days go by. At his legitimate and righteous right exercise of the right to, to self-defense, which fully belongs to the legal sphere of our self-defense. The United States has deployed a vast strategic assets in and around the Korean Peninsula on constant standby and push ahead with the various plan of military action at the critical stage to exhibit its excessive strength and use it under any pretext. For this region, the military and security landscape prevailing Korean Peninsula and the region is creating inherent trigger danger. Early yesterday, with participation of the US nuclear aircraft carrier Calvinson and nuclear power submarine Santa Fe, enormous troops of the United States, the ROK, and the Japan, the strange large scale joint military exercise at the doorstep of the DPRK. Its aggressive nature warrants no excuse. This year alone, the United States has introduced various strategic nuclear assets, including nuclear aircraft carriers, the strategic nuclear submarines, and bombers in and round the Korean Peninsula on nearly 30 frequent occasions, posing the most open and direct military threat to the DPRK. Nowhere in the world, and not in any page of the history, can we find the president, the whereby United States has ever presented a grave threat to this kind to the national security of a UN member state and aggravate the regional situation by mobilizing all its triads of strategic nuclear forces joined even by the troops of its allies. If such actions are not seen as a threat to the global peace and security as enshrined in the UN Charter, there is no reason for the Security Council to exist, and thus it should dissolve itself today, right now. The Korean Peninsula and the region are in the unstable situation are due to increasing military money of the United States and follower nations. The DPRK launched its reconnaissance satellite. It decisively control and handle this situation and thus prevent the outbreak of the new war in the region. It is inevitable undertaking and the minimum exercise of its right to self-defense. Furthermore, no other nation in the world is in the security environment as critical as the DPRK. Yet even those nations are launching the variety of the military satellite into the space without any restrictions. In this context, it is a matter of the lawful and legitimate right of sovereign state to develop, launch, and operate multiple military and the civilian satellites as required by self-defense needs of our state and in accordance with its plan for economic, scientific, and technological development. Yet, that the TPRK has launched the reconnaissance satellite first at this juncture is directly related to the unstable security environment in the region, created by reckless military moves of the United States and its followers. If the United States did not openly mention the end of the regime of the TPRK, if the United States did not make it a policy to use nuclear weapons against our state under the disguise of the commitment to provision of the extended deterrence and enhance the regular visibility of the strategic assets, if the United States did not pursue the setup of the Asian version of the NATO, and consequently, if the United States did not create so extremely dangerous security environment as now in and around the Korean Peninsula, such communication or meteorological satellite launch for peaceable purpose could have been placed on the order of the priority ahead of recognizing the satellite and the efforts of our state for exploration of the outer space. The DPRK right to use of the outer space is above board and legitimate right of the sovereign state recognized by outer space treaty, which stipulate 
I quote, outer space shall be free for exploration and use by all states without the discrimination of any kind on the basis of equality and in accordance with international law, unquote. As for the sanction resolution of the U.S. Security Council against TPRK, which United States and some follower UN member states used as the grounds for criticizing the DPRK's satellite launch. They are no more than illegal and unlawful pieces of the paper running counter to spirit and objective of the UN Charter. They are typical outcome of the heinous hostile policy of the United States aimed at depriving our countries of its sovereignty and right to existence and development. The United States kept insisting that the DPRK is in the violation of the Security Council resolution because it has used ballistic missile technology for its satellite launch. Then I have the question, is the United States launching its satellite with a balloon or catapult? If not with a carrier rocket, that uses the same technology as ballistic missile. Anyone can see that such a logical argument of the United States neither political nor scientific sense. It clearly shows the absurdity of the so-called Security Council sanction resolution against the DPRK. In the long run, I can say with good reason that the United States and its certain followers in position of the UN Security Council sanction resolution upon the DPRK is it just like demanding us to relinquish all rights of the sovereign states and furthermore amount declaring that they would not recognize our state. The rec recognition satellite launched by DPRK becomes an issue, whereas the same conduct of the United States and its allied forces conform to international norm, such a double dealing criterion served as a main factor driving the situation in, in and around the Korean Peninsula to the confrontation and the conflict. Double standards are indeed the first and foremost root cause which strategically degrade authority of the UN Security Council entrusted with important responsibility for maintenance of the international peace and security and arose denunciation and derision rather than respect of the international community. The prime mover in this situation is none other than the United States. For the sake of the peace and stability of the region and the rest of the world, the international community on the side of the justice should no longer in any case tolerate prejudiced and politicized double standard of the handful state and its exclusive group, including the United States. A reckless attempt to deprive the DPRK of its sovereign rights are no different than forcing it to disarm itself. In the event that the United States and its followers try again to encroach upon our national sovereignty by referring to the implementation of irrational, unlawful, and outrageous anti-DPRK sanction resolution of the UN Security Council, it would inevitably trigger the exercise of its legitimate right to self-defense of a sovereign state as enshrined in the UN Charter. It rests entirely on the United States attitude, whether or not the present confrontation, the surrounding legitimate right of the DPRK to exploration of outer space, develop into physical conflict and even into the most serious situation such as a war. UN Security Council should not waste the time and energy are taking issue with exercise of the legitimate right of the sovereign state, overwhelmed by arbitrariness and high-handedness of the specific forces. It should duly pay great attention to removing such a substantial threat to the international peace and security as the killings of the civilians perpetrated in the Middle East under the patronage and protection of the United States. The gone are the days when the high-handedness of the United States was disguised as a justice and when its arbitrary practice worked anywhere in the world. As stated already, DPRK will proud exercise its legitimate right, including satellite launch, no matter what other obstacles stand in the way. It will fulfill its responsibility 
the reliable defense the peace and security Korean Peninsula and in the region from external threats of all hugeies. I thank you. I thank the representative of the GPRK and now give the floor to the representative of the Republic of Korea. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My gratitude goes to you for convening this urgent meeting of the Security Council. My appreciation also goes to ASG Mr. Kiari for his briefing. Mr. President, the Republic of Korea condemns in the strongest possible terms the DPRK's so-called military reconnaissance satellite launch on November 21st, local time, which flagrantly violates multiple Security Council resolutions. The launch took place earlier than the issued no time date, which indicates that the DPRK does not even bother to act on its own announcements, let alone ensure the safety of other countries. The launch was anything but peaceful. The DPRK's statement reads, I quote, the launch will make a significant contribution to definitely ramping the war preparedness of the armed forces and secure the capability to reconnoiter the South Korean region, end quote. The launch also had nothing to do with the legitimate use of outer space. The Article 3 of the Outer Space Treaty says that the exploration and the use of outer space shall be carried out in accordance with international law, including the UN Charter. The DPRK's illegal activities never fall into this category. Any launch that uses ballistic missile technology, regardless of its success or the payload, can contribute to the further advancement of ballistic missile technology, in particular ICBMs, capable of delivering nuclear weapons. As such, multiple Security Council resolutions prohibit any launch by the DPRK using ballistic missile technology. Mr. President, the DPRK is moving beyond, beyond violating the multiple Security Council resolutions to now almost mock the decisions made by the Security Council. The DPRK designated November 18th as the so-called Missile Industry Day to commemorate the test launch of Hwasong-17 ICBM on the same day last year. I cannot find any other country in the world which celebrates in the calendar its illegal activity, explicitly banned by the UN Security Council. Furthermore, the Supreme People's Assembly rubber stamp legislature of the DPRK amended its constitution this September to enshrine its nuclear policy, which significantly lowered the threshold for using nuclear weapons such as allowing for a preemptive nuclear attack against Seoul. We see the DPRK delegation here who denied the legitimacy of the Security Council at this chamber three months ago and who once again repeated the same absurd claim. Mr. President, it is deeply concerning to see the authority of this august body repeatedly eroded and ridiculed by the DPRK. We need to act resolutely before it is too late to fix this. The DPRK is a determined and premeditated serial offender of its obligations under the UN Charter. In particular, to accept and carry out the decisions of the Security Council in accordance with Article 25. The DPRK's astonishing record of violating agreements are not limited to international ones, it has so often unilaterally violated bilateral agreements with the Republic of Korea. To name a few, the July 4th South North Joint Statement in 1972, the Inter-Korean Basic Agreement in 1991, the Joint Declaration of the Denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula in 1992, the June 15th Joint Communique in 2000, the October 4th Declaration in 2007, and the Panmunjom Declaration and the Comprehensive Military Agreement in 2018. 
The objectives of these agreements were to ease military tensions and build a peaceful Korean peninsula based on mutual respect. However, the history amply shows that Pyongyang is ready to renege on the promise of dialogue and cooperation at any moment. Violations of the Comprehensive Military Agreement, or the CMA for short, is the latest case in point. Both sides were to refrain from any hostile military activities in and around the demilitarized zone or bordering areas, whether it be land, sea, or air. No-fly zone that was established within tens of kilometers from the military demarcation line of the DMZ. Some guard posts were to be removed from the DMZ. However, the DPRK abused and practically nullified this military agreement, for example, by drone infiltrations to the Seoul area and the firing of artillery rounds into the coast of the, rec of the ROK. These are only a few examples out of, the, out of the 17 explicit violations by the DPRK, not counting thousands of other relatively minor violations. Moreover, we saw launches of military reconnaissance satellites three times this year, and they have announced additional launches in the near future. With its satellite launch, the DPRK is attempting to secure not only the advancement of ICBM technology, but also reconnaissance capability. The Republic of Korea cannot sit idle with its hands tied alone anymore. As a necessary measure to protect our national security and the safety of our people, my government has decided to suspend a portion of the comprehensive military agreement that pertains to the establishment of no-fly zones. This is a minimum, minimum defensive measure to restore reconnaissance activities, which had been normally conducted before the CMA was signed. Regrettably, but not surprisingly, the DPRK's Defense Ministry announced on November 23rd that it will never be bound by the CMA and forward deploy its military assets in the area near the DMZ, threatening us with a possible high-intensity provocation. This is yet another example showing how unfaithful the DPRK is to its own promises on inter-Korean agreements. Yet the DPRK is shifting responsibility to the ROK and threatening further provocative actions. <clears throat> Mr. President and dear colleagues, my delegation would like to highlight that the DPRK's provocative behavior is no longer a regional issue. It is an issue of global concern directly affecting all parts of the world. Left unchecked, the DPRK's proliferation of weapons and the military technology, whether conventional or even nuclear, will further aggravate insecurity around the globe. The recipients, in addition to belligerent states, could also be terrorists or other non-state entities in any part of the world. For example, supplying ammunition to the Russian Federation in its war against Ukraine. My delegation expresses its grave concern regarding the military cooperation between the Russian Federation and DPRK. All arms transfers to and from the DPRK, as well as technical cooperation concerning its weapons programs, whether conventional or nuclear, directly violate multiple Security Council resolutions. As we have repeatedly emphasized at this chamber, all member states must implement all relevant Security Council resolutions in full. However, if Security Council members violate the resolutions in deliberate and flagrant manner or do not implement the resolutions faithfully, then all our efforts at the Council will count for nothing. We should be reminded once again that the Russian Federation itself voted in favor of all the 10 substantive sanctions resolutions on the DPRK from 2006 up until 2017, including the one establish, establishing an arms embargo. As such, 
We urge Russia to abide by the resolutions and immediately cease such illicit activities. It is regrettable that we hear once again the same misleading arguments today, a fallacy of false equivalence. The DPRK has developed its unlawful nuclear and ballistic missile program for more than three decades based on its own playbook. The root cause lies with the nature of the DPRK regime itself, not the so-called hostile policy or the, uh, of the ROK or the US, which is non-existent. Pyongyang's ever-growing threats are the very reason that the ROK is strengthening its extended deterrence cooperation with the US, not the other way around, as the DPRK claims. It is a legitimate defensive effort in response to the DPRK's increasingly menacing nuclear and missile threats. A responsible government should protect the lives and the safety of its people. It is also regrettable that some erroneous arguments being presented here are representing a false comparison. Our satellite launch is completely legal and was correctly announced beforehand. It is not prohibited by the Security Council resolutions, nor does it pose any threat to international peace and security. It has nothing to do with the development of ICBM technology. <clears throat> the opposite is true of the DPRK's launch, illegal, threatening, and conducive for ICBM development. Mr. President and dear colleagues, once again, I'd like to emphasize the importance of the Council's unity in condemnation of the DPRK and its faithfulness in implementation of Security Council resolutions. Let us unite together against this repeated offender and take a determined step in the name of the UN Security Council. I also stress that the door for dialogue and negotiation remains wide open without any preconditions. We strongly urge the DPRK to cease further escalatory actions, fulfill its international obligations, and return to diplomacy. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank the representative of the ROK, the U.S. representative asked for another statement. I give the floor to the representative thank of the U.S. Thank you, Mr. President, for allowing me to take the floor once again, and I will try to be as brief as possible. We've heard 13 member states sitting around this table uh, call on the DPRK to cease their unlawful testing. So the message is clear here uh, that uh, this is a violation of Security Council resolutions. The DPRK claims it's uh, acting in self-defense, but the self-defense uh, really does not stand here as the U.S. and ROK military exercises, as you know, are routine and they're defensive in nature and we intentionally reduce risk and pursue transparency by announcing the exercises in advance, including the dates and the activities, unlike the DPRK. And unlike the DPRK's launches using ballistic missile technology, these actions are not prohibited by UN Security Council resolutions. So we reject strongly the disingenuous DPRK claim that its missile launches are merely defensive in nature in response to our bilateral and trilateral military exercises. And I think the chronology uh, of these events re reveal the truth. But by the time the United States and the ROK resumed large-scale exercises in August of 2022, the DPRK had already conducted six ICBM launches that year, and its efforts to uh, reconstitute its nuclear test sites were already underway. I also heard, and I want to reiterate, uh, a statement made by my Chinese colleague, and I'll quote, the DPRK's pursuit 
of self-defense cannot come at the expense of the security of its neighbors or the global non-proliferation regime, unquote. Secondly, I'd like to uh, mention the Chinese-Russian so-called humanitarian resolution, which in our view applauds the DPRK for not conducting IRBM and ICBM launches, sanctions relief in the face of the DPRK's unprecedented launches would only send one signal, and that is uh, a disregard for the Security Council uh, and a viol uh, and violation of international law would be overlooked. And I think the Security Council uh, uh, cannot uh, be engaged in that. And I think if either Russia or China want to assist on the humanitarian side, they can do that and continue to do that bilaterally. On the humanitarian situation, I would just like to uh, mention that we do remain deeply concerned. Uh, but I think if you look at DPRK's recent actions, uh, you'll understand what their priorities are. The DPRK has allowed Chinese and Russian diplomats in and members of the anti-doping league so its athletes can travel, but still, UN aid agencies are forbidden from providing the necessary humanitarian assistance that we know is needed uh, in, in that country. Uh, once again, I'd like to express sincerely our offer of dialogue without preconditions. The DPRK only needs to accept. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank the representative of the U.S. I took note that the representative of the DPRK asked for another statement. I give the floor to the representative of the DPRK. Thank you, Mr. President, for giving me the floor. Uh, I'd like to say a few words on the, uh, the, the comment made by U.S. Ambassador. Uh, Self-defense is a legitimate right for DPRK. It is very important for us to correctly understand the key element of the relation between DPRK and United States. The DPRK and United States relation is not merely a relation between unfriendly countries without diplomatic relation, but a relation between belligerent countries, which are more in status technically, legally, practically for seven decades. Under the situation, one belligerent party in the United States is threatening us with a nuclear weapon. It is a legitimate right for the DPRK as another belligerent party to develop, test, manufacture, and possess weapon system equivalent to those that the United States have already possessed and or developing right now. Once again, I clear clearly our position that a legitimate right is the self-defense in the cope with military threat from the United States. And then, yes, ambassador said that door is open for diplomacy. But most important is that create environment for diplomacy and the dialogue. United States repeatedly said that they has a hostile intention toward the DPRK, but it is early empty talks. From the first day foundation of the DPRK, United States has recognized our sovereignty, treat us as enemy state, and openly show its hostility. Hostility is not at all abstract. Military street, double standard like today, is none other than the hostile act we are facing from United States from every day, every year, every month. So, Unless the persistent military threat, the DPRK, are eliminated, our efforts will be continue to strengthen our capability to defend our dignity, safety, interest of our state. I think. Let me just say one thing. 
no weapons have ever been fired by the United States toward the DPRK. We are working with our allies to help them in the protection of their sovereignty against your actions, which are based on paranoia about a possible attack by the United States. If there's anything the United States wants to provide to the DPRK, that is humanitarian assistance for your people and not weapons to destroy your people. Thank you. I thank the representative of the U.S. I now give the floor to the representative of the DPRK again. I cannot, I cannot agree with the other comment because the United States the mobilized strategic assets that like the P-52H strategic nuclear bomb, aircraft carrier, nuclear submarine for joint military drills. That strategic assets are not for defense, but most offensive military hardware specializing strategic strike and missions. So we regard that strategic assault which we are mobilizing for joint military exercise is attacking weapons towards the PRK. It is our challenge. So if United States really wish the peace and stability for diplomacy, it must immediately stop all kinds of the joint military exercise which are conducted under the bear just a code name, I think. I thank the representative of the DPRK. Now I would like to make a few comments in my capacity of the representative of China. In the second statement of the U.S., they quoted me. But the uh, regrettably, the quote is not very accurate to make sure that uh, you will be able to understand China's position better and more clearly. I would like to repeat some of my statements. The security of all countries is indivisible. Any country cannot pursue their own absolute security at the expense of others. If the security of all countries is indivisible, 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 if in closing, I would like to point out that the main parties and the stakeholders of the peninsula are here on this table. I have listened attentively to your statements and also found that the positions and the views of the two sides are very different. And there are even differences in the positions. I think that also means that this is a clear indication that the agreed assumption of engagement in building a mutual trust and 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 the normal names inscribed on the list of speakers. The meeting is adjourned. The Security Council will now begin its consideration of item two of the agenda. I now give the floor to Mr. Khalid Kiari. Mr. President, members of the Security Council, at 10.42 p.m. local time on 21st of November,
the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, DPRK, launched the rocket Cholima-1, loaded with the reconnaissance satellites Maligion-1 from the Sohe Satellite Launching Station. The DPRK's National Aerospace Technology Administration announced that the rocket flew normally along the preset flight track and that the satellite entered orbit at 10.54 p.m. It also announced that the DPRK would be launching several reconnaissance satellites in a short span of time. This follows previous failed attempts on 31st of May and 21st of August this year, also using the Cholima-1 rocket. The DPRK's launches represent a serious risk to international civil aviation and maritime traffic. While the DPRK issued the pre-launch notification to the Japanese Coast Guard, it did not issue airspace or maritime safety notifications to the international maritime organizations, the International Civil Aviation Organization, or the International Telecommunications Union. Mr. President, while sovereign states have the right to benefit from peaceful space activities, Security Council resolutions expressly prohibit the DPRK from conducting any launches using ballistic missile technology. On 21st of November, the Secretary General strongly condemned the launch of yet another military satellite using ballistic missile technology. He reiterated his call on the DPRK to fully comply with its international obligations under all relevant Security Council resolutions and to resume dialogue without preconditions to achieve the goal of sustainable peace and the complete and verifiable denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. Mr. President, the DPRK continues to implement its five-year military plan unveiled in January 2021. It should be recalled that developing a military reconnaissance satellite was part of the plan, <coughs> along with various other weapons systems, including so-called tactical nuclear weapons. On 27th of September, the DPRK adopted the constitutional amendment further enshrining its policy on nuclear forces in the Constitution. As such, the DPRK has consistently demonstrated its strong intention to continue pursuing its nuclear weapons and ballistic missile programs in violation of relevant Security Council resolutions. We emphasize once again our call on the DPRK to refrain from such actions. Mr. President, the increase in nuclear rhetoric on the Korean Peninsula is deeply concerning. The Secretary General has consistently noted that the only way to prevent the use of nuclear weapons is to eliminate them. All states must reinforce and recommit to the nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation regime built over decades, including the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons and the Comprehensive Nuclear Ban Test Ban Treaty which has yet to enter into force. Pending the complete and verifiable denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, it is imperative that the DPRK maintains the highest level of safety at its nuclear facilities. Mr. President, with growing tensions on the Korean Peninsula, the importance of re-establishing communication channels and off-ramps is essential, particularly between military entities. Exercising maximum restraint is critical to avoid unintended accidents or miscalculations. We call on Security Council members to unite and explore practical measures to halt the current negative trend, making full use of the tools of dialogue, diplomacy, and negotiation, while adhering to all Security Council resolutions. Mr. President, on a separate note, I would like to highlight once again concerns regarding the humanitarian situation in DPRK. The United Nations is ready to assist the efforts of DPRK in addressing the basic needs of its vulnerable populations. We continue to closely follow the easing of DPRK border restrictions and urge the DPRK to allow the unimpeded re-entry and rotation of the international community, including the United Nations resident coordinators and other international UN staff. A collective return would positively impact international support to the people of the DPRK, including on the implementation of the 2030 Agenda. Thank you, Mr. President.
I thank Mr. Kihari for his briefing. I now give the floor to those council members who wish to make statements. I give the floor to the representative of the United States. Thank you, Mr. President. And thank you, Assistant Secretary General Kihari, for briefing this council on this grave threat to international peace and security. Many times, this council has urged the DPRK to halt its weapons of mass destruction and ballistic missile programs. Many times, we've asked Pyongyang to reject provocation and embrace negotiation. Many times, we have opened the door to meaningful diplomacy, but time and again, the DPRK has flatly ignored these calls and indeed brazenly violated multiple Security Council resolutions. The DPRK's November 21st launch of a space launch vehicle using ballistic missile technology wasn't even the latest in a long line of such flagrant violations. The very next day, Pyongyang launched another ballistic missile. In addition to these launches, the DPRK has launched three SLVs and 29 ballistic missiles, including four ICBMs in this year alone. And now, a North Korean reconnaissance satellite has been confirmed in orbit. Despite what you might hear today, the DPRK isn't responding to U.S. or allied military activity. No. The DPRK has made its motivations clear. The DPRK is unabashedly trying to advance its nuclear weapons delivery systems by testing ballistic, ballistic missile technology in clear violation of this Council's resolutions. This reckless, unlawful behavior threatens all of the DPRK's neighbors and all member states. As you heard from Mr. Kagyari, there was no notification of this action. Colleagues, this body is charged with maintaining international peace and security. The DPRK is undermining that authority. But it is how we respond that ultimately determines our credibility. And yet there are two permanent members that have been unwilling to condemn this dangerous, exclatory launch and others like it. On the contrary, this past July, senior officials from the Russian Federation and China attended a DPRK military parade. They celebrated alongside Kim Jong-un as he showcased his ballistic missile program, a program explicitly prohibited by the council on which they sit as permanent members. To add insult to injury, Russia is expanding its military relationship with the DPRK, which by Putin's own admission could include helping the DPRK build more satellites like the one launched last week. And our information indicates that the DPRK has provided Russia with more than 1,000 containers of military equipment and munitions that will be used to support Russia's brutal war in Ukraine. Colleagues, how many more times must we gather for briefings like this before Russia and China join us in demanding the DPRK abandon its weapons of mass destruction and ballistic missile programs? What will it take for them to condemn Pyongyang's unlawful WMD and ballistic missile programs and associated global procurement network. For our part, the United States continues to call for dialogue on any topic which the DPRK, with the DPRK without preconditions. The DPRK can choose the time and the topic, but the DPRK needs to make that choice. Colleagues, in recent weeks, we have found common ground on shared matters of global peace and security. This issue should be no different. Today, we call on this council to speak out once again, to encourage the DPRK to focus less on stocking an arsenal and more on stocking the pantries of the DPRK people who suffer from severe economic hardship 
and malnutrition and accept the UN's offer of support. To urge the DPRK 